Welcome back to the Create Your Own Life Show. I am your host, Jeremy Ryan Slate, the co-founder of Command Your Brand. And we help brands to combat cancel culture by placing them on the right podcasts and new media to get out there. You can grab our brand new PR book over at bestpodcastbook.com. And uh, if you're brand new to this channel, like this video, subs- uh, hit, hit that subscribe button and also leave us a comment. Let us know how we're doing. And we have a return guest with us today that I am just so grateful to have back on the show because I've got to give credit where credit is due. Back when I was in grad school, back in 2009, I had a professor that I am still friends with till this day pull me into his office and say, you got to listen to this thing. It's called a podcast. And it was these two guys playing these clips that sounded like a morning show. I'm like, dude, I am not into Z100. And uh, it turned out to be a no, the No Agenda podcast that I still listen to today. And uh, our guest is the host of that show, the podfather himself, Adam Curry. Adam, welcome back to the show, man. Hey, brother. Good to be here. Thanks for, uh, thanks for making room for me. I appreciate it. And Adam, for people that may not be familiar with you and, and what you do, man, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Uh, I'm a Virgo. I'm 59 years old. I'll turn 60 this year. Uh, this is my natural hair, although the color isn't natural. Uh, um, I, I've had a broadcast career. Uh, started in radio when I was building my first radio when I was 13. Uh, got into pirate radio. I grew up in Amsterdam, although born in the U.S. Uh, and I am a U.S. citizen. Um, uh, got into uh, pirate radio around 15 and um, rose up through the Dutch schooling system, tried college for a couple months in the U.S., didn't like that, came back and then uh, by some uh, some plan, not my own, I got into television, into music television. Uh, this is in 1984 in, in Holland um, and also into paid uh, professional uh, broadcast radio. Um, uh, in 1986, MTV called me and asked me to come and work for them in the U.S. in New York. I did that for about seven years, and along the way, really almost from the get-go, I discovered the internet. Um, in um, gosh, uh, 80, well, really 87, 88, uh, before there was a World Wide Web, I was always drawn to that. And somewhere around 93 or 94, uh, I le- left MTV, started my own company. Um, basically an internet services company was very new at the time. I was building websites, uh, really content for Budweiser and for Reebok. And, you know, we built a lot of these, these uh, original websites for them. And I always knew that broadcasting somehow would happen at the time it was the web. You know, it was, it was pictures, animated GIFs, maybe that was the extent of it. Some see you see me video at one frame a second, but I knew it was coming. Um, we took that public in 1996. It grew to a pretty big company. Then I went back to uh, back to Europe um, and tootled around for a bit. Learned how to fly helicopters, airplanes. Spent all my money. Um, and then uh, with Dave Weiner, we invented podcasting uh, around the well. The technology we actually invented in 2000, uh, mm-hmm. and it was working at the time. But it wasn't until I saw the iPod. Um, that uh, and that was, I guess, 2004. That I went, oh, wait a minute, that's not a, a digital Walkman. That's a radio. I recognized that because it looked just like the portable transistor AM radio my grandmother had given me when I was six or seven, a little nine volt battery, and I could, you know, listen to basketball games under my pillow at night. Always fascinated by audio only. Um, I do video by exception for people I like. <laughs> I really despise it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, started podcasting uh, even before we had a name for it. Um, Steve Jobs uh, called around 2006 and said, Adam, I want to build radios for you. And I want to put this into, into our iPods officially. And uh, I looked at him and went, uh, yeah, that sounds great. Um, and uh, actually started a podcast network out in San Francisco, raised some money for that, learned that you can't uh, monetize the network. That's really not the, uh, the, the world that we live in anymore and have a, a you know, a very, uh, I think very different view of where media is going and, uh, how RSS distribution truly is, I think the way to go for everyone ultimately. Um, and about f- uh, three, three and a half years ago, saw that that very same Apple who would, you know, really put podcasting on the map is now starting to control it or had a little bit too much control and uh, we're deciding who could be on it and who couldn't be. And so then I called up a good friend of mine in Alabama, Dave Jones, 
And I said, Dave, uh, we're going to build an index. Uh, well, actually, I said, what do you think about this? Should we build an index where developers can create apps and not have to deal with, uh, with any big corporate company? And Dave, of course, went, sure, let's do it. Uh, and we did. And so now, uh, three and a half years later, we have uh, oh, almost 70 apps and services using that, 16 uh, modern podcast apps that also have value for value monetization built right in, and a burgeoning community, an open source community, um, which any open source community that hasn't blown up in a three-year period is amazing uh, in general. And uh, so I'm still doing uh, the podcast. I started with John C. Dvorak 16 years ago, the No Agenda show that you referenced. I'd love to know what Professor... Uh, turned you on to that. Uh, we do have that, that level of listeners from professors to teachers to uh, lawyers, law enforcement, um, nurses. I mean, you name it. We have and all ages from eight to 88, basically. It's an amazing, um, it's an amazing community that we built up, probably about a million people, we, we guess, we don't really know. Uh, who have supported this uh, throughout all these years. And and now I just have the pleasure of working with um, people younger than me in their 30s mainly on uh, keeping podcasting open, keeping it um, available to all um, and protecting it from uh, the podcast industrial complex and whatever else is out there, which of course ties into what you do because uh, our main thing is, you know, you can't get deplatformed um, off of these systems. And we find that very important really to maintain in when it comes to podcasting, the true freedom to speak, you know, it, 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 you're speaking on a podcast. We want to make sure that you can always continue uh, to do that no matter who you are. It's funny. I, I don't remember when it was, but you made the statement on a, a no agenda show. And I keep quoting you time after time. And that's that podcasting is the last bastion of free speech. And if, and if you look at it, you know, it's never before have we been in a point in history where we actually had the ability to, to say something different than what the standard media is saying. And I, and I think it really, it's, it's opened us stuff up, especially in the last few years when it's been a very closed, what you can and can't say. Well, not many people know that you know, blogging, you know, uh, that really podcasting came out of blogging. Dave Weiner had already invented blogging. It was RSS, RSS based distribution. I just saw an opportunity to add media to that and really almost obfuscate the blogging part. Um, but when, um, when Twitter first started, you know, it was called a micro blogging platform. That's what, um, you know, there were, there were lots of blogging companies. You had, um, uh, movable type, you had WordPress, you know, some of these are still around and, and thriving WordPress, certainly. Um, but although, you know, the WordPress blog has turned much more into a, a publishing platform that a lot of companies use, mainly because open source, well supported. Um, but even Twitter uh, was, uh, they launched as a podcast company called Odeo. And so they were RSS based. And, um, and they pivoted within a couple of weeks and turned into Twitter. Funny enough, it was RSS based, which was, you know, the one thing RSS doesn't do very well is uh, be in one single aggregated place, uh, which is why we had the fail whale all the time. Uh, so they retooled that, but it really was blogging and um, Google at the time before, uh, well, at, when all this uh, launched, they had something called Google Reader, which was really an aggregator. Uh, if you almost an index, like podcast index for podcasts, they were an index uh, for blogs and people loved it. I mean, th people would uh, go to Google Reader and say, I'm looking for a blog about this. And then you would able to find it and then read those RSS feeds. And they killed that off. I can't remember if it was for Google Plus or... Um, uh, you know, one of their failed products. They haven't really launched any 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 successful products they since just their buy initial other search. Products. Yeah, they, they're good at buying them. Yeah, they have some good products they've purchased. Um, so yeah, that, that you know that really ruined the the concept of blogging and and the whole reason because it's really the same technology. The reason why podcasting took off is because Apple assumed that role of being the central RSS aggregator for all podcast feeds. Now there's only four, four and a half million, uh, whereas blogs, there were many, many million more. Uh, but if someone were to do that and one day maybe we'll get angry enough and we'll do it um, and would turn that into a, an aggregator also for RSS blogs, um, I think we could see a resurgence uh, of that. And 
not have to deal with, you know, what we're dealing with now, which is platforms that determine what you can and can't say, which is all mainly based upon um, their, their ability to maintain uh, relationships with advertisers and in some cases with governments. And I, before we get too far away from it, I do have to mention, so the professor is Dr. Sean Lake, and uh, you guys run a value for value model on No Agenda. So we both often make fun of each other in your donation segments, you know, calling each other douchebags and, and stuff oh, like that. Oh, okay. I got but you. He, Yo, nice. So he All actually, right. he guilted me into my, my knighthood a few years ago of, uh, you know, finally dropping the, dropping the G with you guys. Um, but and and now, funny enough, so my degree is in is in the Roman Empire. So he was my advisor. So now that everybody's talking about Roman Empire, I'm suddenly like doing the media rounds on shows that like I actually don't have the I wouldn't have the ability to be on. Was I not talking about Rome? Funny enough, um, fascinating. But, but anyway, um, so I guess looking at it though, like, did you have any idea when you started podcasting as a platform that? it would become the, I guess, the cultural force it's become because you look at even during the pandemic, like, you know, Joe Rogan was outranking a lot of the, the nightly news segments, even if you combine them. Like, did you have any idea that, that it could become something like this or, or, or what were your thoughts when you were putting it together? Um, interesting question. I would say no. Um, at the time, uh, I was just looking to broadcast, you know, we didn't have any of the tools. We didn't even have uh, uh, phones. We didn't have smartphones at the time. So for me, it was just, hey, look, here's a way where uh, it was revolutionary in the fact that um, you couldn't really stream when we invented this. There was no, there was no people, a lot of people still on dial up. Uh, one of the, the main uh, infrastructure improvements was cable modems and maybe some ADSL. So you could leave it on, you had always on computing, not fast, but always on. Mm -hmm. So even to get a, you know, a 50 or 60 megabyte uh, MP3 file, it would take quite a while for it to download, might even have to restart the download a couple of times. So the idea that um, you didn't tune into the radio show, but the radio show came to you when it was ready to be accessed and you could then listen to it when you wanted to, that was kind of the revolutionary twist there. And uh, in addition to that, you know, there's no limitation on time, uh, no limitation on, you know, when, when you do it um, or where you do it. Uh, so I knew that that was something that was big. And, and I always knew that we'd be broadcasting on the internet somehow, but the, the model was problematic, certainly with streaming, because, you know, if you look at a traditional broadcast model and you pay, let's say $100,000 a month for a transmitter, every incremental person you get to listen to your signal, in theory, you should be able to, you know, uh, make more money in advertising revenue on the internet, certainly in those early days bandwidth was very dear and very expensive. So every incremental listener you added really added to your cost. And, and there was no, we weren't, we weren't even thought, thinking about advertising. This was not about advertising at all. It was really, or making money. It was just, dude, I just, I, I just want to broadcast. I want to make a cool show. I got something to say. And for me in the beginning, the daily source code, it was purely, I was only talking about the development and the developers who were creating these applications, because we didn't have apps, but applications uh, for Windows and Linux and, and the Mac. Uh, and that was the topic, you know, and then later stuff came in, you know, that are of my other interests um, uh, and my own path and just, you know, of growing up that I, it came into the, like no agenda and the stuff that we do there. But I never, um, never really thought about that uh, at all. Well, it seems like I think more of what you've done now has really helped to to protect that. And I guess looking at, it's been a couple of years since we talked about it. It's it's funny because I know the Ukraine war just started at the time and it's somehow still going. But um, we were talking it's about- It's about to end. Don't worry. It's ending. I, I really hope so. Like, because now you got the popes like, I right, put out the white flag and they're like, no, Pope, shut up. Um, but like- <laughs> Looking at it, podcasting 2.0 was a big development as part of that to really get things, you know, more on the blockchain and get them, you know, where they weren't as centralized. How is that project going and, and how do you feel like we're, we're kind of going for free speech in the podcast world? Well, anyone who wants it, it's there for them. That's, that's the good news. Um, what, what we basically did is we replicated, um, and, you know, I'd say the main index of podcasts was Apple. Um, and Thanks to um, the needs of their own app, they allowed anyone who had 
a podcast app to access their index and, and retrieve information. So in the early days, your podcast app, you would subscribe to a couple podcasts and your app was actually churning in the background, checking to see if there was a new episode. Now, that's okay when you had to have a couple hundred, maybe when you have four million, five million um, a, it becomes unwieldy to search it. You can't subscribe to all of them to be able to search them. So you need a place to find feeds and a place that can, um, certainly for, uh, for apps can update you when something uh, new has been published. So, uh, all of the independent apps think overcast, pocket cast, uh, podcast addict, there's tons of them. Um, they were using the Apple index and when Apple decided, well, this person's not good enough. Um, and it's irrelevant to me, as long as you're not breaking any laws, you know, which is very hard in speech, but there are some, by U.S. constitutional standards, there are you know, a couple of things where you can, and even even tort law is tort law. You know, if someone wants to um, libel someone, they'll have to deal with it. You know, that's not my problem. Um, and they shouldn't be taken off of any platform because of it. Uh, so when Apple started to do that, that was a signal like, oh no, we can't have this because, you know, that's the, the, you know, first they came for fill in the blank. And uh, so I, you know, especially growing up in Amsterdam, I know that, you know, the, this is a very slippery slope if you don't say something quickly. Yes. So, um, and Dave has the same uh, uh, feelings about that and vision as I did. And so we just replicated the index and then we made uh, the API open and freely available to any developer. And a lot of developers were very interested because, you know, whether they're doing it for fun or selling a subscription to their app or whatever, they knew that, you know, obviously Apple could not only take, make stuff unavailable, but they could also stop uh, access if they wanted to. There's no, there's no contract. There's no developer contract with Apple for accessing their, uh, their database as an independent app developer for podcasts. And they have agreements for everything else, but not that one. So that's, you know, it's always iffy. Like, what if they decided they don't want independent apps anymore? Um, and that's we, always been one of my big concerns about Spotify basically trying to buy podcasting, right? Is like, is like, well, what if Spotify changes their mind about podcasting? And I think that's been a big concern there, too. Well, they did. Basically, they spent a billion dollars and it didn't work. You know, they, they, they tried to own it all and they tried to bring everybody to them and be the premier app. And it turns out... People, that's not the way people think. That's the people like their apps for different reasons uh, and they don't all want Spotify and maybe they don't like the experience or whatever it was or philosophical reasons. It doesn't matter. But yes, it's very dangerous to, to have that in one place. And podcasting traditionally has been beautifully decentralized. Uh, pod, there's a thousand podcast hosting companies, some with a couple hundred, some with a couple hundred thousand. The median is probably 10 to 30,000 podcast uh, customers that they have. You can do it yourself. You can host it from home. You can host it, you know, on Amazon, AWS. There's a million different ways um, to host your podcast. You don't need to have a hosting company. So that was really decentralized. And then to have, um, only one app or two, you know, literally looking at Apple, not only is it dangerous for, um, you know, for uh, freedom of speech, it, it also stymies um, innovation yeah. because you had these two sides. If Apple wouldn't implement a feature, then no other hosting company was going to use it because, hey, Apple's not using it. All the independent apps are using that, so they won't do it. And this had been this way for 10 years. People are having these conversations. I kind of checked out of it. And then when I went back in with Dave and said, okay, we're, we're going to launch this index, we saw that a lot of apps were really not only interested in switching away from Apple, but also they had ideas. Hey, we got some ideas for some features. Okay. So instead of replacing RSS, you can extend it with something called a namespace. This is a very normal in computer uh, programming. In fact, Apple had extended RSS with their, uh, some of their iTunes special tags. So, you know, you can, um, you can, there's just a few things you can do that they added sure. functionality, but it's really specific to Apple uh, products and their, and their app. So we added the podcast namespace. And the first thing we added was, uh, uh, the value for value, which was at the time we started this, I, I've been a Bitcoiner since almost day one and learned a lot of hard lessons along the way. 
particularly selling all my Bitcoin at $900. I had to get back in when, when it dipped below 3000 it's, it's closing in on, I think, 70000 now. Is that where we're at at the moment? We're at right now 72.3. So yeah, it's, it's doing pretty good. Um, um, and, we could t- and I'd love to talk about that later. Yeah. Uh, but what was beautiful is this um, um, second layer of Bitcoin had come into play called the Lightning Network. And the Lightning Network... Um, really lets you do all of the, it really, the promise of the Lightning Network was micro transactions. That was the promise. And, um, and that's one of those promises that I always look at and go, oh, really? This is just like my refrigerator will know when I'm out of milk and automatically order it for me. I'm still waiting for that one. But micro uh, transaction turns out it's really good at that because this, the current smallest um, denominator of Bitcoin is a Satoshi, which is, you know, uh, less than I guess it's 0.07 cents. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, a fraction of a penny still. Um, but you can aggregate those and you can send them very fast with no or very low fee. Uh, and it's completely programmable. So having pioneered the value for value model with John C. Dvorak, which is very simple. I mean, it's, it's not easy for people to do because it does require some practice, but it's basically, I'm giving you this for free this content, um, if it's of any value to you in any manner whatsoever, please consider returning it with time, talent, or treasure, the three T's. Uh, and through that, we've had never had the expense of building a website or hosting our content. We've always had people donate that as, as time and talent. And then the treasure part uh, turned out a lot of people value our content in ways we never expected. If you Say, if you tell people, okay, you got to subscribe $5 a month, otherwise you can't get it, your results may be very limited. But when you say, just send me whatever you think it's worth, we found that a lot of people sent $50, some sent $500, and one sent $5,000 within the first week of asking. Now, there's a, a feedback loop where you want to recognize people and thank them for that. And it just kind of, you go into the spin cycle. And, you know, we've gamified it with all kinds of different things, but really the, it's, you mentioned earlier, the douchebag de-douching, these are all things that we didn't create. We had our, produ- we also don't call people listeners, we call them producers. Um, they, you know, they'll write in and say, okay, I'm calling out uh, uh, Jeremy as a douchebag because he listens, he's never donated. And then you hear that you donate 50 bucks and you say, I want to be de-douched. We didn't come up with these terms. This is all all the the producing uh, audience. Um, and numerology is really important. So we have a show on the 14th of March. That's Pi Day. So we know people will be donating three dollars and fourteen cents, thirty one dollars and forty cents, three hundred and fourteen dollars, and they just love it. People always want an excuse to donate for some reason, um, and they'll always look for an excuse to not donate as well. Yeah. So so the idea was to put that into the apps. So you'd have zero friction. Your app is basically a wallet. Uh, You load it up with uh, with value. You can you know you can take it from dollars and turn it into these sats satoshis, and you can determine like ah this podcast I want to send it a dollar an hour. So the minute you hit play, this is the beautiful circle of life. You've got ones and zeros coming down the internet, turning into MP3 and audio for your ears. At the same time, you're sending ones and zeros back to that person. And that's uh, in value that they can then go and exchange for dollars or whatever else they want to. And uh, as a part of that, we also put in the concept of a split. And by the way, there's no one, there's no one in between it. So your wallet is your sovereign wallet. You're using that to send directly to the podcaster. No one's in the middle. Adam's not in the middle. Nothing. It's you directly to the podcaster. But as a podcaster, you can also determine, I want to divvy this up. I have a co-host, so we'll just take 40%. I'll give 5% to someone who's promoting the show, 5% to a producer. Um, uh, All these different um, uh, pieces of the ecosystem, which were never able to get compensated easily. Um, And at the same time, apps have now started saying, really from the beginning, hey, my app is free, but I'm going to take 1% of everything you send to the podcaster so that you can support my app. And people love it. They love mm-hmm. this idea. And now, you know, app guys, developers, they were never in the value chain. They didn't get any ad money from Rogan. You know, it surpassed them. And, and they're really basically one of the most important pieces of the puzzle. 
Um, and often just seen as, well, that app should be free. Well, yeah, an app can be free, but if you're sending out value anyway, you support the whole ecosystem. So that was the beginning. That was the first extra feature that we put in there. Um, and now there's 27. I mean, this, it's unbelievable. We have uh, transcripts and chapters and location tags and, uh, and guests. So you can see you know, who's on the podcast and search by it. And the podcast index itself is now a very rich uh, environment uh, where you can get a lot of information as an app developer. And we also publish the whole database. If you want to start a podcast index next to ours, please, you know, in fact, we'd love for someone to, to do it better than we do it. Um, Cause it's, you know, it's, it's a legacy project for us. It's not a, it's not a moneymaker. Um, now we do also accept um, value for value and people, the, the app, the app developers support what we do. They're also basically supporting their, their competitors. I mean, it's a very beautiful system that has grown quite organically. And I think at the core of that is RSS and, and Bitcoin or really the lightning network. I think that value exchange, um, that's really what's kept this whole uh, crazy group together. If you appreciate the work that we do here and you want to support this show, the biggest way you can do that is by supporting the products that we know, use, and love and that I recommend for you here on the show. The first that I want to talk about is my pillow, literally one of my favorite products. The my pillow classic is what I use every single night. It's handled a lot of my neck pain, a lot of my back pain. As you guys know, I've been a competitive powerlifter since my early twenties. I've retired from that, but I still take pretty good care of myself, and I'm still pulling some heavy weights. As I pulled 500 last week on deadlift, and uh, our favorite product from we travel is actually the my pillow travel pillow, and it's one of the things that we actually give to absolutely everybody. It is a great product to fall asleep on. So if you want to go to MyPillow.com slash C-Y-O-L, they have some really great holiday deals over there. You can get up to 66% off of select products. Also, one of the biggest changes in my life over the years has been handling a lot of the parasites in my body. A number of years ago, I did a cleanse with uh, Dr. Jason Dean, and we removed these things called liver fluke from my body. They were actually eating my liver. It was kind of crazy. And every few months, I do either a parasite cleanse or his full moon detox that he's doing right now. So if you want to head over to bravetv.store slash C-Y-O-L and uh, grab some of his amazing products over there. I know he has a great holiday special going on right now as well. Support our sponsors. They help this show to continue and they help us to do what we're doing. And we could not do it without you. And you could do it just by uh, using the power of the purse and uh, supporting the products that we love. Thanks. Well, I, I guess like looking at it, so the reason I come to you, Adam, is for the, the awesome media deconstruction you guys do. And it's it's funny because as I mentioned, I've been listening to your show for like 13 or 14 years now at this point. I'm, I tell everyone about it, but I'm terrible at telling them about it. I'm like, yeah, it's these two guys. They make fun of the news. They make it seem a lot less uh, stressful and I understand my world better. And and I, I, I guess like looking That's at it, it. That's a bumper but, sticker right there. But, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you listen like, so because here's the problem, right? I listen to a lot of like, I don't listen to mainstream news. I listen to all a lot of alternative stuff and it has the ability to like get you real jacked up real fast. And I, and I find what happens with you guys is I come to you and I get a better deconstruction of what I got that was scaring the shit out of me somewhere else. And then it seems a lot less stressful. And I guess when, when you look at it, how do you look at a story where you're deconstructing it? Like, how do you, how do you look at it in such a way that you're like, okay, I have full understanding of this. I understand what it means, but it doesn't need to scare the shit out of you. Well, first of all, thank you. That's a huge compliment. If, if, if you would ask John and I, what we really want is we want what you just said. We want to just spin people down. We're it's, it's a performance. You know, we, we want to make people laugh. I, we actually make each other laugh. That's, you know, that's the, the biggest compliment is if I make John laugh or he makes me laugh. Uh, and we don't like meetings. I mean, that's, that's really, that was our goal. You know, let's not have any meetings. So we won't do any ads. That'll never work. You know, we're, we're no good at that. Um, but also we don't want to meet with each other, you know, just show up, you bring your stuff. I bring my stuff. We'll do three hours of stuff. Um, I, I think over time, uh, and a lot of this just has to, ha has to do with where I grew up, how I grew up, um, certain family members, all kinds of stuff has influenced me, of course. Um, but I, I start that, uh, for the love of money is the root of all evil. I mean, it's all about money somewhere. So that's the easy path to what is this about? Um, and, you know, that's from what is meant to scare the crap out of you is usually a promotion for an entertainment product, like a movie. Okay, let's yeah. see if it's something. So it's pretty, 
Easy Something to. in your house could kill you. News at 10. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and it's meant to sell you something somewhere along the line. Uh, so that's a very, and coming from media, we both come from traditional broadcast, radio, television. John has a lot of print experience. So, you know, we understand a lot of, you know, what is being done is to promote something. Um, news is, um, you know, news is rarely news. It's usually public relations is usually mm-hmm. some kind of promotion. And if not from a commercial product, from the government or for, from government agencies. So uh, you're always looking through that. And over time, you just learn to see the keywords, you see what's happening. Um, I, le- I learned a long time ago not to get upset and worry about stuff. And, uh, and I've gotten much, much better at that, certainly in the last couple of years. Um, so for me, it also, when I'm, when, and we're working all the time, I'm always looking at stuff and I have a system to file things and really isn't until show day where I bring it all together. Uh, so over time we've developed, uh, I've certainly developed a way to just like file stuff away and I don't even think about it. It's like, I'm just going on with my life. I'm going to go walk the dog. It's all good. Um, but also over time we built up quite, uh, an enthusiastic audience of producers who are expert at something. There's always an expert at, at, at uh, tree maintenance. There's always an expert at, on fires. There's always an expert on finances. And they will send in what we call our boots on the ground. And they're usually pretty good. Um, yeah, sometimes they've been off, but I would say in general, you know, again, everyone's an expert at one certain thing for sure, sometimes multiple. And we've, um, We've trained each other, um, the audience and John and myself, to keep that communication open and make sure that when you have something to say, you tell us and, you know, don't go on Twitter or Mastodon and say, these guys suck. They don't know what they're talking about. No, you should be telling me directly so we can either correct it or even better when you see the new story coming down the pike, you know, please let us know. It's the thing is called the Mangelman amnesia effect. Mm-hmm. You know, when you read something in the newspaper that you know a lot about and you always see that it's incorrect, inaccurate, or completely wrong, you have to assume the rest of the news in the newspaper is at that same level of uh, of accuracy, which is low, uh, for things you know nothing about. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I think all these these principles have kind of built up throughout the years. And sadly, what we're seeing uh, today, we're we're actually seeing a very strong alternative media uh, front, I would say. We're seeing a lot of uh, people out there, but um, they are really just, uh, it, to me, it's like listening or watching to Twitter. You know, mm-hmm. it's just outrage. It's spinning people up. It's, a, it, oh, it's crazy. I can't believe it. Uh, and not really doing much to to dive into it a little further. And for us, that's not necessarily, you know, I'm not a, I'm not uh, a doctor, but I can sure tell you when someone on television is spinning you up with some fear about something or something that may be connected to some other uh, financial interest. Uh, I so think a the- lot of people lack, lack that though too, because I think that was when you're, you're talking about like being able to look at a story and say, cause I think when, when you, a lot of people have a strange idea about their news, right? They don't consider like, they think the news is out there looking for a good story and they're going to publish it once that story. And it's, it's just not that way. It's somebody paid for this somewhere. Somebody's running a campaign somewhere. And I, I guess when you look at it, why do you think most people can't decipher news when they look at it? They can't decipher it from who paid for this. We all have a job in the kingdom, brother. This is mine. And, you know, it's like, it's not most people when, when you lay it out for them once or twice and they feel good about what you're saying, they'll be like, oh, you know what? I understand that, but it's, it's amazing. So for instance, AI, I mean, this is the, people get so spun up over AI. It's going to take my job away. They're coming after Christians, you know, you name it. It's, I've heard it all. I'm like, no, uh, first of all, I've seen this AI, um, hype come and go several times. And, you know, and, and John and I actually know a bit about technology and the inner workings of Silicon Valley and how the money flows. And again, this is a bubble that we're in. And there's a lot of a, a lot of hype, and it's actually going to destroy a lot of companies. Not the AI part, but the companies who are jumping into AI to provide AI services because it's just mm-hmm. not that good. It's great marketing, you know. It's artificial intelligence. Uh, oh, we have to have laws. It's so scary. That's kind of off the table. In case you hadn't noticed, yep. uh, it was really, really. Oh, it's scary. We have to have government regulation. Um, this is all just promotion. 
So um, also, thankfully, because of our model, this is all I do. You know, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm doing podcasting 2.0, but this is what I do most of the day is just look at this stuff. It's like, oh, what's the world around me doing? Okay, well, this doesn't feel right. And also, luckily, there's two of us. Uh, mm-hmm. If it was just me, I don't think it would be anywhere or just John. It wouldn't work. We need, we need the two personalities. We are definitely different. Uh, we need to call each other out. We need to disagree. Um, these are all important uh, facets. That and read a lot of IRS Form 990s, right? Um, I do like <laughs> reading those. Well, that's a go-to, man. It's like when you're a nonprofit. I want to see how much money you got coming in, if available, where it's coming from, or who you're giving it to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is something that I just learned to do a long time ago. My wife, actually, uh, Tina, she uh, she's a, a communications C-level suite a professional. She retired from uh, from uh, corporate business, but you know she would put a lot of them together. And she also uh, likes reading about them. You know, it's like, oh, well, what do these guys really do? That's all the information is usually in there that you need to know about a nonprofit or a non-governmental organization, which is also quite interesting. What are the biggest threads that you're following right now? Because I think that's the the thing too, is like, especially with the way our news cycle runs, people get kind of jacked up about everything. And I think there's only a few things that actually matter. So I guess what kind of threads are you following the most at the moment? Well, the threat, there's a couple for me. Um, you know, wars in general uh, are always interesting because if you really look historically at wars, they come at times when money needs to be created, when money needs to be printed. Yes. Um, now, uh, we didn't have a war uh, in the last uh, couple of cycles, and, but we did have another interesting event, which was COVID. And boy, did we create a lot of money, you know, $7 trillion, if not more, in, and multiple of that in derivatives of, of money. Because um, it really does come down to that ultimately. I mean, and this goes back to my early education about fiat money. Um, when I first read End the Fed from Ron Paul, I'm like, oh, Federal Reserve, that's not actually a government organization. It sounds so governmenty. Um, so when you learn about money and how it, and where interest rates come from, and then inflation is, is really, it's a technical term for money printing, not for the result. You know, we've been taught inflation is your eggs costing more, but where does that come from? Well, that comes from the government creating money. So while that's never going to be um, a thread that the news is is portraying necessarily, they they moan about prices and shrinkflation. Our own president did that about something about the Snickers bars in the State of the Union. But um, it's fun to kind of follow the real information, what's really happening, and you know, and why why things are why money is being created at a, at a faster rate and. That's usually when the banks are in trouble, and that is, by definition, the Federal Reserve and central banks. And, uh, you know, so so the war is shifting, um, and it had to shift because the American people certainly were sick and tired of sending 50 or 90 or $100 billion at a time to Ukraine when we clearly could use some money printed here in the U.S., and so that's not something that's moving, but you, the military industrial complex, or as they say in the news, the military industrial base uh, needs it, you know, and also that's what's keeping our, our country afloat. I mean, uh, this is millions and millions of jobs uh, in 40 states for all this war stuff. That is sadly what kind of what we do in America. So we need a, a better war, a bigger war. And, uh, you know, China, we saw it coming down the pike very, I mean, it's easy to spot with Taiwan. And what's so great about China is it would be a sea conflict. It's not going to be a conflict. I don't think there'll be any actual war. Uh, we, we're in bed with China. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the, the China buys our debt. They spend our, their money in America. I mean, it's, it's obvious. Um, but, you know, you get to build huge ships and submarines and you get to repurpose air bases all over the Indo-Pacific. This is fantastic. So we actually said this in advance, like, oh, watch, it's going to, the minute Victoria Newland resigned or retired, which is even more interesting, oh, this means Ukraine is ending. Uh, we're shifting the pivot. You get the new Victoria Newland, this guy called Kurt Campbell. 
He's longtime uh, China policy guy. So we're going to do stuff for China and we're going to make China sound very scary. Oh, bing, there's TikTok. Oh, no, CCP. There's military age men coming across the border. China's scary. China's scary. So when we can relevate it um, and just say, look, this is why they're saying this. This is not because TikTok spies on you any more than Instagram or Facebook or the Twitter app. In fact, they may even spy on you more. This is because we need to, if you want, if you want to catch the Americans public about something, it bear, immigration, yeah. Okay, we have military age men from China crossing the border, which by the way, they're not all men and they certainly don't look like they're military ready. But for, for what that is, if you want people to lose their crap, tell them you're turning off TikTok. Mm-hmm. This gets people's attention. Oh, China's really bad. So, well, and, you know, and I, I think people get really jacked up about that one because I know um, you guys have talked out a lot about it. But also, uh, Jen Briney from Cultural uh, from Congressional Dish did a really good segment, kind of just taking the uh, the actual hearings on this stuff. And when you realize it's it's literally just like they're jealous of our companies doing the same thing. It's like, oh, oh not, why do I, why just, do I care that not much? Not just jealous. If you look at Gallagher, the Republican who uh, introduced this bill this time mm-hmm. around, his number two contributor is Google. I mean, YouTube, in the bill itself, I haven't heard Jen's uh, take on this. I, I'll have to listen so to it. She's a little bit older, but she did a really good job playing all the hearings for this. Uh, Jen is very, she's very good. Congressional Dish is a must listen. She is a, a, um, a Dvorak disciple. Um, uh, you know, it's really three parts of this bill. And the most interesting part is the minute this is decided, if it passes, then uh, TikTok, ByteDance, has to immediately start making their content for everyone exportable in machine-readable format so that all your videos can be sucked up by Instagram or by YouTube. I mean, it's it's obvious. Those guys, it hurts their, I mean, TikTok is eating their advertising lunch. There's no doubt yes. about it. It's, it's really big and it's a big problem. Um, but, you know, to, to throw into the mix there, oh, the CCP, it's spyware, it's digital fentanyl. Are you kidding me? And this is the kind of stuff they're saying. So we love exposing that, making fun of it. So people can, you know, put it in the box where it belongs, which is promotion. And it's meant to get you all mad about your TikTok going away. But really in general, it's to print money so that we can raise our GDP, keep our economy going. Um, this is the same reason drugs is no, the war on drugs is a laugh because uh, maybe 25 to 35% of our economy runs on illegal drugs and the rest on the legal drugs. I mean, this is, this is another one of those big industries is a, a pharmaceutical. So it all kind of comes back to entertainment products, military, uh, pharma, these are the big industries that we run on and making money, printing money. I and mean, you'll see now that Ozempic is going to go into Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, it's going to cost the American taxpayer hundreds of billions of dollars on an annual basis, maybe even a trillion. And every, sadly, everyone's going to be deemed, you know, uh, obese. A lot of people are obese, but you're going to put children on it. You have to be on it for the rest of your life. I mean, it's, it's a nightmare what they're doing right now. And it's all just for money. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I will say, I think you guys are almost a full year ahead on the Ozempic thing. Like, I didn't hear a lot of people talking about it initially, but you guys kind of picked up on the the winds of that. But I guess bringing it back around to, um, we mentioned earlier that Bitcoin, I think he said is at like 72,000. And to me, like, it's cool to see it worth that, but it kind of also kind of scares the shit out of me at the same time saying like, you know, how bad a shape is the economy in that people are kind of pulling out of it? And I guess... What, what do you think about where Bitcoin's currently at? And I guess, what does it say about our current situation? Well, let's talk about what Bitcoin is. And I have standing in this because I did not believe in it. I thought it was, uh, John and I both thought it was, you know, beanie babies, stupid. Uh, people were sending, sending it to me. I, I actually held on to them. I had 65 Bitcoin and sold them at $900 to go day trade on NASDAQ. What an idiot. Uh, now, it, it's still... Uh, I, you know, I had like $60,000 in, in profit from zero. So it's not like that was bad, but sure. I didn't understand what it really was. And so when, during the pandemic, when, um, this is still early days for Bitcoin, I'll explain why. Um, when it dipped below uh, 4,000, my wife and I decided we're going to go buy and we buy a little bit every, we bought a, a nice chunk then, but since then 
Every day, just a small amount. Every day, a small amount. It's called DCA, dollar cost average. So over time, um, you know, you're buying at different levels, but, you know, it was down around 20, 35 for, for a year. So we were buying at that level, a um, small amount a day, but that's now more than doubled. So that's quite a good investment. Bitcoin, because of the nature of what it is, and remember, it has no CEO, no one's in charge of it. This is a, a, global, a global system. Is really um, the only besides my vote is the only other thing I actually own, uh, and I own it because uh, I have my twenty four words that I have memorized. You can write them down. That is your property. No one can take that from you in any other manner than you giving it to them. So if someone discovers where your your secret key is or they bang it out of you, okay, then you divulge it. There's many ways to protect yourself, but it's really digital property. It's something that you can own. It also happens to be really handy to exchange value in uh, reasonably quickly. So uh, my daughter lives in Rotterdam. Um, uh, during the pandemic, you know, her, especially in Europe, her gas and electricity prices almost tripled. She needed some help. Uh, sending uh, fiat money to her would take several days, cost $75 in wire fees through Chase, uh, would take all kinds of hoops. But I could also just send her Bitcoin and within a couple minutes, she had the Bitcoin, she could sell it and immediately she had access to those funds. So it was a great way to send money internationally. That's what is certainly one of the first use cases. When you look over time because of the nature of Bitcoin um, and it's really supply and demand, people want it, there's increasingly less available of it. So unlike gold, where if a lot of people really want gold, we can go and find more gold. We can dig more gold. It's expensive and it's hard to get it out of the earth and it's dirty and it, you know, people, you know, people die over it in Africa, but we can probably get more gold. Money printing is easy. That's why your, your purchasing power devalues. When I was a kid in the seventies, we had the jump for Toyota commercials on television and it was a Toyota truck for $5,000. Now you're lucky if you can get that same truck for $50,000. That's inflation. That's money printing devaluation of of the money by making more of it available. So in the last four years, 40% of all dollars were created. I mean, that's amazing if you look over time. So that devaluation is now coming to the forefront in uh, in the form of inflation, i.e. your purchasing power is going away because you can get less for your dollar. Um, Sadly, wages don't catch up that quick ever. That's just the nature of it. Um, So Bitcoin is really a saving technology for the working poor and the middle class. If you just put a little bit in every single day, a little bit, you can buy $1 if you want. You can buy $1 worth of Bitcoin every day, guaranteed within a five-year, 10-year, 15-year period that will increase in value probably multiple fold. At the same time, it's a great educational tool for a young new generation so that they can learn the value of saving, truly saving and not buying things on credit, which is what the whole system is geared toward, is getting you on the credit train. Um, When I was a kid, we were told incorrectly, compounded interest, son, that's what really works for you. <laughs> well, true. If you Buy save your certificates, the deposit. They would, yeah, they would say, you know, if you if you uh, save a penny a day, you'll have you know this much by the time you're thirty. But what they didn't explain or weren't able to explain is that over that you know twenty thirty year period, the purchasing power of that money would be devalued uh, significantly. This is the inverse with Bitcoin, uh, and it's and. We're still kind of in early days, although it's now 13, 14 years old. So uh, it's starting to show um, uh, that when you have something that can be used, has all of these properties, you can store your value in there, you can transfer it. Um, is it really a currency? I think it is because we're using it. We've been using it now for several years in podcasting. Um, uh, my wife and I do a podcast and people send us uh uh, value for value sats and Bitcoin. And we turn around and we buy our beef from KNC cattle with that. I mean, that's beautiful. Now, and, and by the way, I bought, um, we bought about five or $600 worth of, we usually spend about $500 every 
two to three months, just the two of us. So we eat for a long time off of that. Do you, do you guys buy like a, a whole cow, a quarter cow, a half cow? What do you buy? Um, we, we, buy the, we buy a half cow. Well, um, this is part of the beef initiative. And so they have their own processing. So we'll just get cuts of meat, um, okay. but it probably equals about a quarter. Uh, I'd say we're probably close, close to that sometimes. But again, you go out to dinner, you, if you go out to dinner three times, you spent the same amount that we would spend on beef for three months. Um, but I sent that to Cole over at KNC. And so let's say it was $500 when I sent it to him. It's now worth 600 and I'm delighted for him. You know, if he didn't spend it right away, if he was able to hold on to it, the way Bitcoin is working the way it should have. I made a choice. My choice was I want to spend this on beef right now. So I'm going to, you know, cash in my chips here. I'm going to send that to him. Important decision for me. I could have held on to it mm -hmm. and eaten bread, you know, <laughs> and bought more beef today. So <laughs> this is the, <coughs> excuse me. This is the educational tool that I think Bitcoin is becoming for new generations. Don't think of, about value as credit, but Ed, like my nephew, mm -hmm. he texts me, he says, uncle, 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 man, he's 25, says the Bitcoin that I bought, you know, it, it, Bitcoin went crazy. I can buy a new MacBook. I said, yeah, you can, but do you want, do you really need the MacBook right now? Or do you want to wait a little bit and buy a new car? in two years. And he's like, oh yeah, I got to think about that. Cause now he's seen, he's seen the rise of this volatility. So it goes up and down, but he's seen over time, over two, three year period, he's seen the Bitcoin increases in value. And so now he's making real grown up decisions, not, you know, can I get enough credit to make the monthly payment? No, no, no. Do I really need this right now at this moment in my life? Is the old laptop still go good enough? Do I want to be a baller and show this thing off or do I want to wait and get the car? So this is what I love about where we're at right now with Bitcoin. Again, saving tool for, and when I I'm specifically say saving, not saving, saving, because I think it saves the working poor. Uh, maybe it's a saving, saving tool for the working poor, savings tool for the middle class, and an educational tool for a whole new generation of capitalists. What do you think this says about, I guess, the rest of the market? Do you think it's just the, the consumer now is just better educated? Or do you think they're also looking for some stability just based on how the rest of the market's going? Well, when you, what do you mean by market? Well, if, if you look at like, like here's, a, here's a, a, a really good example. So I love Volkswagens. Maybe I shouldn't, but I do. Um, and um, the last time I had some major Volkswagen repairs done was 2007. It was like 80 bucks an hour. So now those same repairs are 180 bucks an hour. So it's like it becomes obvious to the consumer that the money you're making has like no value. So you're like, well, shoot, man, I got to go somewhere. Do you think that's also part of it pushing people into Bitcoin? Yes. Well, yes, that's part of the educational part. Now people are starting to understand um, also through proliferation of media, um, through the Internet. Now they're understanding what money printing is what inflation is. I mean, really, if you get into Bitcoin and you read one or two books about money, you'll understand what's going on. And this is something that I was never taught. I wasn't taught about the Federal Reserve. I wasn't taught about money printing. I wasn't taught about what real inflation is, how that really works. You know, why, 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 does the, why do the banks, the Federal Reserve, want to keep uh, inflation at 2%? Well, that means that they want to keep printing 2% more money every single year. Well, they've, they've increased that significantly, don't even expect it to come anywhere near 3%, if that's even the true number. You know, so you can see that your dollar today will be worth 20, uh, uh, you know, uh, two to three cents less uh, month over month, year over year. And that compounds, you know, even the reporting of inflation. Oh, inflation's going down. It's, you know, now it's the 6%. Yeah, that's the, it's the rate of inflation. It's compounded. It's on top of the 8% last year. So this is insane. These are big amounts. So yes. Um, by the way, what kind of Volkswagen do you have? Um, I have a Tiguan now. I used to have a souped up GTI that you could barely fit a cigarette pack under the front bumper and it had to like pumping out 28 pounds of boost, but I, I was much younger in those days. The Tiguan <laughs> has, has a great chassis. That's a, it's a very, it's a very nice automobile. I'm a, I mean, I had, my first car was a Volkswagen Beetle of 1303. Oh, wow. Um, I could take the engine out myself in 20 minutes. I needed some help to get it back in. Um, you know, I replaced that thing many times. I love, I love that car. That was, that was one of my favorites.
Well, with with two kids, it's like a great size vehicle. But now um, we got our third one coming in June, so it's like my wife's looking for that car with the extra row in it. So now we're trying to figure all that out. <laughs> well, and thank you by the way, because that's the one thing we need from uh, from this generation, from from people like you, is we need kids. We need kids. This is how you this is how you protect America. It's how you protect any country. Uh, is we we need people making babies. Th- this is why the borders are open. Um, because we're not, we're not making enough uh, kids and it doesn't matter black, brown, yellow, red, who gives a crap as long as they're here in America and you want to make kids and build a family, having families, all of this stuff is what will really get us back uh, on track and we'll save a lot of hassle in the future for future generations. Absolutely. Well, Adam, I appreciate you coming back on today, man. It's always an awesome conversation with you. And as I said, like, I am just personally very grateful to you, um, because, you know, what you've created in podcasting and also just your content has literally changed my life. You know, I, oh, I run you. a business where I employ 15 people that I wouldn't employ and, you know, it's allows me to have these conversations every day. So just every single day, I'm grateful to you, man. So thank you for being here. Oh, God bless you, man. I, I appreciate you saying that and uh, keep doing what you're doing. You show me there's a lot of hope in, uh, in the United States. I, I really love it. And thanks again. I'll come on anytime you want. Absolutely. And where can people find you if they want to find more, man? Uh, well, uh, I am on, uh, uh, on Twitter. That may be easy if you just want to get a hold of me at, at Adam Curry, but I'm Adam at Curry.com on email. And, uh, to see all of what we're doing, it's uh, podcasting Um, and you can see all the different stuff and find all the apps. And, uh, and I would recommend everybody, uh, give a new podcast app a shot. Very cool. Adam Curry. Thank you so much for uh, coming back on to the show again today, man. My pleasure.